and to all who are here in our building and also of course to all who are joining us all around the world online. It's a morning of stand-ins. Uh, Helen's Lawson's our session clerk. It's not quite right this morning. She's feeling a bit under the weather. So uh, I'm deputising for just for a wee minute to uh, make the one or two introductions. First of all, just a couple of wee things to mention about the, the notices that have been on the screen and also the printed sheet. Uh, the Summer Sunday School will be starting in a few weeks' time and uh, Jean Stevenson asks me to just make a wee alteration. Jean's now looking for a, a volunteer for one Sunday only. It says in the notice, she's looking for volunteers 30th of June and also a Sunday in July. July is now full up, so thank you to all those who have volunteered to help with this very important piece of work throughout the summer. So we're now looking for one volunteer for 30th of June. If you can manage, have a word with Jean later on. Um, we omitted to say last Sunday that you're not getting out today. Is that right? Because the American brunch is on. <laughs> now the second intimation on the sheet uh, affirms that. Through in the hall there are a huge amount of pancakes, bacon, maple syrup, teas, coffees, you name it. Huge amount of fun. Uh, this year all the proceeds are going to help with the costs of our holiday club. Which uh, this will be our fourth year for our holiday club. We run it the last week at the end of July. And uh, we need money, of course, for food. We give a, a lunch and also for all the crafts and activities. So if you're able to join us through in the big hall, you'll love it later on for all the fun of the American brunch and help out our holiday club. If you can't manage, uh, donations are always welcome, of course, to help with the costs of that particular event. Um, a couple of wee things just to mention. Right at the top of the sheet, it mentions that uh, Rob, uh, Rob Jones, our local Rob's at a, other chaps this morning. I think it's a family baptism. I think the latest grandchild has been baptised today. So uh, we're delighted to welcome Ian McKenzie. I brought Ian McKenzie back to lead us in worship this morning. And we note that uh, Rob won't be here next Sunday. Murdo MacDonald, our interim moderator, will be joining us next Sunday uh, for morning worship. The, the final welcome is to say welcome to Andrew Stephen and thank you to Andrew for standing in for Eric and uh, with the playing of the music this morning. With that, I'm delighted to hand over to Ian, and we look forward to meeting us in God's love and prayer, and our blessing this morning with our service. Thank you. Yes, we have three stand-ins this morning. Uh, we are glad indeed to join together to worship the Lord. Praise God with shouts of joy, all people, said the psalmist. How wonderful are the things that you do. Let us worship God together. Our opening hymn of praise reminds us that God, who is invisible, is all around us and is with us. Immortal, invisible God, only wise. <laughs> Oh, no. 
The psalmist continued, Your power, O God, is so great. Your enemies bow in fear before you. Everyone on earth worships you. They sing praise to your great name. And we have sung praise to Nidini. Let us therefore bow and worship. Let us pray. God of magnificent grace and God of eternal blessings, how can we thank you enough, O oh God, for all that you have given us? Every day we use and enjoy your gifts. Every day we may seek your guiding spirit. Every day we have your promises and your power. How can we grasp the enormity of all that you've given to us? We can open our hearts and we can pour out thanks. Thanks that you have given us the risen Christ. Thanks that you have poured out your Holy Spirit upon us. Thanks that your being and presence makes all things new. Thanks that in knowing you, our lives are transformed. So we give you thanks that with you, from the smallest word and the tiniest seed, great things can grow and your work can prosper. We come, O oh Lord, to ask you to help each one of us to make sense of life to see beyond the visible, to understand life through heaven's eyes, to make sense of this transitory experience in the light of heaven and your eternal purposes. We come that you would give us a vision of life beyond the here and now, to give us a faith that trusts your leading and chooses to follow your will. Oh, we know you are a God from far above and beyond us, but we know you personally through Jesus, your Son. We cannot be the judge of others, but we can begin to know something of our own selves. We can seek your forgiveness and believe it, forgiveness for failings and wrongdoings, and so we confess now in the quietness of this place and in the, within our innermost beings, we confess faults that we are ashamed to voice out loud. We confess opportunities for service we've missed. We confess temptations that we've given in to and for not trusting. Lord, hear us as we come to you. Forgive us through Jesus' great sacrifice for us all and enfold us in the great family of believers. Release us now in the power of your Spirit to live, and serve, and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray these prayers. And using his words we pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to be thinking of some of the tests in life that Abraham went through. And here's a hymn that reminds us we're not to be afraid. For God has called us by our own name and we belong to him. Do not be afraid. It's CH4191 and on the screen.
now to our scripture reading and we continue in the series of reflections on the books in Genesis which Rob has been <coughs> uh, presented to us the last few Sundays. We're now moved on to Genesis 16 and we have the first 16 verses from that book to share this morning. Let's hear the word of God. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarah mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, why, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Be'er Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abraham a son, and Abraham gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Amen. The Lord bless to us this reading from his word. To his name alone be the praise and the glory. Let's just continue our worship as we read on into to hear Ian's reflection on that reading. Before we do that, let's sing CH4489, our next hymn, Come Down, O Love Divine. Oh, 
Rob has been taking you through the life of Abram. He's called the father of all who believe in Romans chapter 4. And we continue this story today. Abram began his faith journey when God called him at 75 years of age. So there's hope for many of us today in that decade. While he was at Ur in Babylonia, and then at Haran in Syria, he called him, and throughout his long life, Abram has been walking by faith, trusting God's word, learning to recognize God when he spoke, and even more astonished to hear the wonderful promises that God has given to him. He has promised to bless a whole world through him. Abraham believed God. He was called. He believed God when he did not know where he was going to from Haran and Syria. He was called to a country which only later he would discover was Canaan, the land of God's promise. So he didn't know where. He believed God when he didn't know when God was going to accomplish the son. And the years were going on, and no son appeared. Abram believed God when he didn't know how God was going to bring it into being. Because Sarah was old, past a normal childbearing age. And Abram believed God when he didn't know why God was tarrying so long, and later on in chapter 22, why God asked him to sacrifice his nearest and dearest. So he didn't know where, he didn't know when, he didn't know how, and he didn't know why, but he was called and he believed. So Abram's faith was tested throughout his life. It's not without its stumbles and slips. Living by faith is not easy. But God has given Abraham promises. Living by faith. First of all, there's the family test. Quarrels broke out over grazing. Genesis 13. Between Lot's herdmen and Abram's. And Lot chose, chose by sight the lush. And Abraham trusted God by faith in the high lands of promise. Then comes a famine test, and the test of famine brought Abram out of the land of promise and down to Egypt, where he tried to deceive and tell lies to save his own skin. Oh, Abraham, you should have stayed and been true to yourself and true to Sarah. You shouldn't deviate from the way of faith. But incidentally, the beautiful Sarah seems to have gotten a new maid in Egypt, Hagar. Was she a gift from Pharaoh? Doesn't say. But Abram comes back into the land and he gets a new blessing. El Shaddai, the God of heights and the God of power. We call it Almighty. El Shaddai. He received renewed promises. And even when he had to rescue poor, poor Lot from the jaws of slavery, even if you have to wait for years for the promise fulfilled, I will bless you, Abraham, and your seed will be numerous. Genesis 15. God promises Abraham that his descendants as numerous as the sky, the stars in this night sky. Abraham, look up into the sky. And any who have been in a place where there's no light knows that there's thousands. We can count easily 8,000 in a night sky. Folks have done it. I've never, I've never got beyond a few. But he promises descendants and <coughs> offspring as plentiful as the sand in the seashore. And God cuts a covenant. Animals were separated 
and the walk between making this covenant. And Abram has a vision of blessing for generations to come. Now, all throughout the years of Abram's life, he has learned to walk by faith and not by sight. He has learned to recognize the voice of God and thrilled to the promises he was hearing, the blessings he was giving, without any strings. Descendants he would give to this childless pair. Abram had learned to trust God, even when the passing years was telling another story. There was no heir. Abram is now 85 years old. Ten years have passed. Waiting is hard. Trusting in God is not easy. And Sarah is fretting. Where is the child God promised? Time is passing. I'm beyond childbearing age. How can we get a son so that the blessings that God has given us are there? God mentioned the son, but he didn't. And he mentioned you, but he didn't mention the mother. So Sarah has an alternative plan. A plan B. One that she can put into action. In Babylon and Assyria, common law allowed patriarchs to have a child by a surrogate mother, a maid or a concubine, who would be named officially as the family offspring. Other nations are doing it, Abraham. We can do it too. Here's a practical solution. Since I'm unable to bear a son, take my maid Hagar and sleep with her. Now Abraham, the man of faith, is faced with another test. God's plan? Is it plan A or plan B? What's he going to do? Will he trust God to fulfill his promise? Well, or will he step off the high plateau of faith and descend down into the valley of mists and bogs where you don't know where you're going? living by sense and sight. Well, he did go down. The same child, and as I was reading this, I thought of a book I'd read long ago by Isabel Kuhn called By Searching. Isabel Kuhn was the daughter of Christian parents, and she goes to university, and in the English class, she encounters for the first time intellectual unbelief. Of course, no one in this enlightened age believes any more in the myths of Genesis and... But here, Dr. Sedgwick paused in his lecture as if a thought occurred. With a twinkle in his eye, he says, well, maybe I should better test this before being so dogmatic. And facing the large freshman class who were hanging on his words and pulling his face to gravity, he said, is anyone here who believes there is a heaven and a hell, who believes that the story of Genesis is true, please raise your hand. And he waited for a response. She says, up went my hand as bravely as I could muster. I looked around to see if there was, I had a comrade in my stand. Only the other one hand, hand was up in all that group of a hundred students, Dr. Sedgwick smiled, and as if pathetic without embarrassment, he conceded. Oh, you just believe that because your papa and your mama told you so. And he continued with his lecture, assuming once and for all that no thinking human being believed the Bible anymore. And so as she goes back home, she mulls over this question. Why do I believe the Bible? Was it only because her mum and dad told her? And so at the end of my walk home, I came to the conclusion that I would henceforth accept no theories of life which I had not proven personally. And quite ignorant of where that would lead me, I had unconsciously stepped off the highway where man walks with his face lifted Godward 
and the pure piney sense of the height calling him upward and down onto the misty flats. That in-between level place of easy going, nothing very good attempted, nothing bad either, where men walk in the mist, telling each other that no one can see things clearly. The misty flats where the in-betweeners drift to and fro. Life has no end but amusement and pleasure. No purpose where the hair drift with the strongest pull and no response for opposing anything. So she did get back onto the house. She did to go spend the time. But she meets another Christian and she finds that the way of faith is real. But only after a time of hard questioning. And she went on to become a missionary indeed to China, to the Lisu people in China, where she met another Christian whom she married. And so she got back onto the platform of faith. Living by faith is equally hard today, isn't it? For we find the word of God often ridiculed and discounted. So Abraham is now 85 years old. And Sarah says, let's help God along. He doesn't seem to be answering our prayers. Let's ensure we have a descendant and the blessing, we'll get the blessings God's mentioned. What can you, what can do it? We can do it if you take my maid as a concubine. And we'll have a son through her and we'll make him our own. If we do it this way, we'll get all the blessings. Ah, uh, Abraham. You had a choice of living by faith and waiting by faith or doing it your own thing, turning to plan B, Sarah's plan, and an alternative to God's great plan. So Abraham took Sarah, took a Hagar as childbearer and did sleep with her. And soon it's obvious, Hagar is pregnant when she's with child. Everything goes down firmly from that way forward. Hagar, with a child growing within, looks down her nose, and the child is Sarah. There's a smirk in her face, a pride in her heart, triumph in her eyes. Sarah's green with envy, furious with everyone. She takes it out on her husband. <laughs> Look what you've done, Abraham. It's all your fault. You agreed to this soon. I'm despised. Do something. forgetting it was her own suggestion <laughs> that Abram agreed to. Will Abram take charge and counsel her to make the best of things? Well, Abram opts out. Domestic fears is your responsibility, Sarah. Do what you think best. Oh, Abram, you're not helping. So Sarah takes it out. If she can't take it out, she takes it out in the pregnant maid. She ill-treats her. She makes everything impossible for her. And it's not surprising. Hagar runs off from the domestic abuse into the wilderness, down the south on the road to Egypt, back from where she came, her homeland. Everything has gone wrong since they stepped off the highway of faith and tried to engineer their own solution getting impatient with the word of promise from God. Now, interestingly, does God toss out Hagar? Does he abandon the unborn son? No. God is a God who will remain faithful to his promise, even though humans fail to keep trust in him. God steps in, and his angel meets her at a desert spring, he calls her by name, Hagar, servant or slave of Abraham, of Sarah. It's quite unique in, in Scripture to have someone called by name by God himself, a lady. God asks where she has come from and where she is going. Now God, the Almighty One, knows all about where people are. He sees everything. He has seen her. And he has heard her cry and seen her plight. 
El Roy, the one who sees. And Hagar calls God by a new name. He was El Shaddai. And now for her, he is the God who sees me. What a wonderful thing. But the Hagar is commanded, go back to Sarah, submit to her. You are going to be included in Abraham's blessing. The son is Abraham's after all, and he has God's blessing, unconditional blessing. Hagar is told you're to call your son Ishmael. And Ishmael means God hears. God sees, God hears. What a message. If only Abram would, and as they went, Hagar went back to the family, she went back with a new trust. The God saw her, and God continued to see her. And she told the story to Abram and to, he, and to Sarah, and maybe she got the strength to, to go back home. She calls the one before her, the one who sees me, El Roy. Now, Abram will get his son, Isaac. 14 years will pass. And when Abram reaches 100 years, here's a wee family tree. See Abram and Sarah in the middle? He gets the son, and the son is called, of course, Isaac. Laughter. And laughter is brought to the house. And then, through Jacob and the 12 sons of Jacob, we get Israel and the Jewish nation. And out of the Jewish nation comes Jesus the Christ. What a blessing. But go to the left and you see Hagar. And she gets a son, Ishmael. And what does he? He produces 12 sons too. And he is the father of the Arab nations. And they've continued right down through. And Muhammad and the great uh, Arabian peoples of today. Actually, later on, he marries a second wife, Keturah, and he has other six sons. And they've tried to trace these, and some of them are Arabian, and some would even say Hindu, uh, Indian, so I don't know. Uh, however, the blessing, living by faith, you see, God's promises come in God's way and in God's timing. And living by faith should make us trust the God who is faithful and should make us more patient when we don't see things happening God's way in our society. Hagar is astounded to discover God knows all about her and sees her. But Abraham, by Abraham's plan B, Hagar has her son, he will be a wanderer and a rebel, living by his wits and living by his fists. He has an unbelievable future. He will be circumcised, chapter 25. He will be included in the Abrahamic covenant. And he will have 12 sons and will live to 137 years of age. And so there's the Arab nations. But living by faith today, how are we living? We have God's word of promise in the Old Testament and the New Covenant, sealed by the blessed Son of God. Jesus says, trust in God, trust also in me. We have a calling. When we believe Jesus, we have pardon for all our sins. So we can have confidence each day as a child of God. When we believe, we have a status as God's children. And we need to show God's love. By this shall all one know you're the love family when you care for others. In all the circumstances we find ourselves, in our vocation, our calling, God knows us. In our family circumstances, in our work, we should seek daily guidance and listen to the Spirit who has come at Pentecost, which you celebrate today and who is with us. We never left the earth after he came. We ask him to guide us. We don't second guess. Go ahead and then say, God bless what I've already done. 
we have to ask him. And we are called too to be a blessing. And God knows we are special. God will only be able to do things through you. And you have a special place that no one else can fill. You are that unique. So faith accepts that God sees us, really sees us. That God really hears our prayers. And God really guides us day by day into the service that only we can do. So, the message is, don't opt for plan B. Make sure you live by faith. For faith is God's way, God's blessing. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word to us all today. We're going to continue with the hymn Before the Throne of God Above. 466 and CH4 and on the screen.
Heavenly Father, every day you see us, you know all about us, from waking up in the morning to laying our head on the pillow at night. You are the God who sees us and cares for us. So we give you thanks this morning and present these gifts from the bounty that you have given to us. Receive them with our thanksgiving. Lord our God, when folk are going through tough times and feel people misunderstand or judge us unfairly, You are the God who sees us and cares for us. When our hopes are dashed and we don't know where to turn, when we feel alone or abandoned, you are the God who sees us and cares for us. When others' lives seem to be prospering but our life is on hold, Keep us from becoming impatient or losing faith. You are the God who sees us and cares for us. When we experience awkward relationship at work and we know we ought to speak a word to guide our lips, for you are the God who sees us and cares for us. When we feel pain or sorrow or disappointments too deep for words, you are the God who sees us and cares for us. And when good things come our way and life is sweetness and joy, let our hearts not become proud for we know that tests will come. You are the God who sees us and cares for us. So lead us out on the journey of faith this week so that we may all hear your voice afresh and be prompted to trust and obey you in all our choices this week. May the blessing of God be upon us. Amen. Hearken. They're coming. good morning it's someone else this morning it's not Rob Uh, it's Ian I'm a member here and I usually sit down and I watch you coming in you've had fun today have you yeah I can see you've had fun and some of you are wearing something nice upon your head and I can see that it is a flame why are you wearing a flame on your head are you on fire Mm, what is the flame? What? what, what? It's a yeah. You're all on fire. Why? Why have we got a, a flame? The flame reminds us of the Holy Spirit came. That's God, isn't it? God. You can't see God, can you? 
Can you hear him? Well, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, but there was a time when actually God came. And the first of all, they heard him. And what did it sound like? There was something and God came at Jerusalem long ago and it sounded like The wind, yes. Now it's quite interesting that the word for wind whoosh, is the same as the word for spirit. Spirit. And the, so when the wind came, everybody rushed to say, what's, what's this great wind? What's and then they saw flames on each of the disciples, didn't they? Disciples, didn't they? There was actually 120 gathered in Jerusalem and apparently the flame kept dividing and rested. And do you know what they did when they had the flame? What happened? They touched the people, yeah. And did they do anything else? They were able to speak different languages. Now, I don't know about you. I know English, yeah. So, and usually a few words, but my French is not very good. Parlez-vous français? What did I say? What did I say? Parlez-vous français? Oh, bonjour. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> bonjour. Um, adios, amigo. That's Spanish, yes. And I, I, well, I can't speak anything. If somebody answers in Spanish, I would be totally lost. But they spoke different. And somebody from away in the north said, oh, wait a minute. That's like where I come from. Do you know, we were on a cruise, and somebody was on the cruise, and I said, I know where you come from. You come from Inverness because they spoke exactly the way I used to do. And sure enough, this girl, Fraser, came from Inverness. So we recognize uh, the, our dialect. And God actually spoke a great word that day. And 3,000 people believed in God. And that was the beginning of the church. <coughs> and so we're here today because the flame has spread God's spirit. And we know that God sees us. In fact, that's what we've been hearing in, and we've been looking at today, that God sees every one of us and God hears us and God cares for us. So what more can we need? We need to trust him. And so we trust that God is with us every day. Every day as we grow up, there'll be people who say, God's rubbish, there's no such a thing. But we've got to trust in the unseen one whom we know and we're taught so have fun this week. And yes, God is with us. And he's got a special plan for you. He knows all about you and what you're going to become. And I, know, I hope that God will bless you as you go on in life. So we're going to sing a nice wee... By the way, I'll just have a wee look at you. Yes. A special helper. And of course, you're still... Oh, you've got the big flame there. And you've still got to color in a few wee flames there too. Let me see yours. Oh, you've got a lot of color there. Yep, and the big flame. Yeah, and there's the wee flames too. Everybody has. When we trust in, in, in Jesus, we have God's spirit within us to tell us what's right and what's wrong. Now we're going to sing a wee hymn, and it's called, What a Mighty God We Serve. And you sing it. There's four, each, each um, verse has got the same four lines. So we're going to sing, sing it four times. La 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 la
blessing. Now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, be with us and remain with us, now and forever.